Did I say that right? Agua. Bienvenidos a what? Welcome to what? Welcome to the car. Uh, al carro. El carro. Bienvenidos coche? al carro. El coche. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Al coche. Um, well, we, um, I'm with my guy Jeremy Lee Quinn here. Um, unblocked, as, as some might know him as. Uh, unblocked from, live. Unblocked live yeah. from his stream. Um, we're already jumping frames here a little bit. Oh, really? Uh, we're just going to do a quick, we're take a quick second to kind of let you guys know some of our personal feelings about the uh, about the trip we were just on uh, to the border uh, and then across the border in Mexico for the last couple days, uh, just down here in Yuma, Arizona. I know there's a lot of people that were curious about um, what it was like and, uh, and and what the experience was, was going to be like for me. And uh, I know for for me, uh, well, Jeremy, let me ask you, what, what did, what was life for you? The thing that changed, first of all, when you're, when you're actually there, it changes your perspective, for sure. I, I was, uh, we were in the desert yesterday, and just being under that heat, where it's so desolate, so barren, and it just continues for miles, uh, that experience is sort of just feeling it, feeling the heat on your body, how far away you are and, and how everything looks the same around you that was just being in that experience was eye-opening you know just real fast just about that point um, because we were together like walking out there there was these moments where like I would get nervous when like I was like Jeremy I'd yell for you and you wouldn't respond and I was like oh man like if we get separated like the reception our phone reception wasn't you know it didn't work out there and so I was like, man, there, that, that you can imagine if that happens, a child wanders off from a group, or the group gets detached from their guide, you know, yeah. if they're walking at night, and it's really easy to get lost over because it all looks the same. Yeah. Especially if like people are going at, you know, get uh, some going at different paces. In other words, if somebody's getting tired, or, you know, yeah, how the group would would you, how the group would have to compensate. You kind of think about that. The other thing was just the big revelation for me was that the wall isn't always on the border. Right. And that was very surprising. Yeah. That it could be set back by a couple of football fields or it could be set back by a couple of miles yeah. from the actual border. Absolutely. And, which means that, you know, that one day that we saw the three Brazilian youngsters who were hiking on the other side of the wall our impression was oh they're they're very close to crossing over if they just get around the wall but what we didn't realize was they were already in the united states yeah. when they stopped at that water station that was set back from the actual border the wall was a couple football fields away from the actual border so that surprised me because that then, I, then it's like oh well the wall isn't actually keeping people out it's just uh, obstructing and assuring that they can be processed or encountered by, by Border Patrol. And which, the thing, yeah, yeah, sorry, I was saying, the thing that I saw about the wall too was <clears throat> the wall is almost more just for the monitoring station aspect of it. So the wall, when they built it, um, like I said, they had to terraform the land on either side of the wall. And so it went up into the hills. And where we were at was a bit closer to actual like civilization. But there's stretches like we're taking the highway right now that's running along the southern border through towards Tijuana and there's stretches where it is just I mean like miles I, I mean 60 70 80 miles of just desert sand that goes on forever and ever and so and the reason that that's important to think about when you're thinking about these people that are making this crossing some of the stuff we found out in the desert was like heartbreaking uh, at one point, I came across the baby bottle that was, you know, well out into the desert. And it wasn't like somebody was out camping in the desert. That's not what these are, you know, and it still had milk in it. So it was from a more recent trek that had gone across. It had about a third of the bottle of milk. Um, we found a baby's toy kit, which was a, a child's, which had like a, a play doctor kit. And it had like, um, you know, like a, a baby stethoscope. It had like, you know, little like stuff. Like a plastic one. A pla one. Right. A toy stethoscope. But inside of the kit was a child's face mask and a pair of child's underwear. And there was also a box of Cheerios. Like little, uh, like cardboard. These frames are dropping on us, which sucks. Oh, yeah. And we cannot.
not hit the way it's impossible. This whole area, man, I'm telling you guys, it's been ridiculous with the reception. Is um, it is it's impossible. It's impossible to get a, a good feed. But <clears throat> but the border was definitely an eye opener. Um, in one of the conversations we had too, with the first night we got there, we went down to San Luis and we were on. We actually had, like I said, we went into Mexico uh, for two days. And we had a chance to talk to people in Mexico and get a look at what the border approach would, would, would optically be from the south heading north. But, um, and we we were able to talk to a, a, this 27-year veteran of the, um, the, the border patrol. And um, he was really candid. He used some terms that we were, like, I kept having to ask him. He was like, yeah. these, these tonks. I was like, what's a tonk? Yeah, yeah. Know? And like, we'll have to brainstorm on what's, what, I mean, is, what. What can tonk mean? Is, if anybody knows, tell us what that slang means. Yeah. Tonk. We didn't, well, I've never heard that before. Yeah. But uh, that was the way that uh, undocumented were referred to. So that was kind of surprising. I was super yeah. candid with us. And, yeah. uh, you know, so it was a kind of slice of, of life into what the mindset of, of somebody who's working the water patrol. Is. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things that you said was, uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap Jeremy in. Someone says wrap Jeremy in tinfoil, like an antenna. <laughs> like, I don't have to hold on to you, like an old school TV. But one of the things he said that was very revealing was that... Uh, uh, wrap you in tinfoil. Wrap me in tinfoil, yeah. We might you'd, have, get, you'd get more reception. You'd get better reception, right? <laughs> we'll have a little satellite dish here. <laughs> My big ass head, it wouldn't be hard, man. <laughs> But one of the things he said that was really wild to me was, we were like, hey, is there sections of the border where people can just walk over? And he was like, absolutely. We were like, what happens when they come over? And he was like, well, they come looking for us. They actually look for the border control, border patrol. And the border patrol takes them to a detention center or an, a processing center. Uh, they fingerprint them. They check to make sure they don't have any criminal, like, extenuating criminal backgrounds that might bar them from being allowed into the United States, which is what they're really looking for. And uh, they hold them for no more than 72 hours, and then they release them into America. That, um, that was a revelation. Yeah. I mean, just hearing him talk about that, about the process, and uh, that people aren't held, and, and unless there is a significant reason, such as a past history or criminal right. uh, history, that, that, that after 72 hours, they're pretty much on their way. Right. You know, because I, I still expect it to find, I guess, something a little more akin to what I, my expectations were from mainstream uh, media. The, uh, these children detention facilities, and they have a staggering number. You guys, I think it said something like 18,000 unaccompanied minors came through in just April alone, which is a horrific number. You're thinking about these young children that are coming across. And then there's the children that come across with people, and this is where the real problem comes in. There's no documentation to prove that that child actually belongs as a child to one of these individuals that they're traveling with. And that's where some of the real tragedy comes in, like I said, with the human trafficking, uh, the sex trafficking. And these kids are being rented as well. It would, it would be interesting to know numbers and talk to an organization, an advocacy group, or yeah. somebody to get at Because we know of these stories anecdotally. But my big question is, well, what are the actual numbers? What are the uh, uh, verifiable numbers? Right, right. And that's that That number is 17,000. That one came across as that's an actual statistic, the number that came through. Um, but I would like to know that what he said was interesting. Um, also, yeah, share the stream. I, I guess that we're people are, most people aren't getting notifications. And it could be that I'm on a little bit of a shadow ban. I don't know. But that these kids would come up from like Venezuela, Guatemala, Honduras, and but they were rented to travel with groups to give the group the illusion of, um, of a family unit. And it gives them more of a passable uh, creed, and so, credential rather, and so then they're able to make their way into the States. But none of that, you guys, all of that to me is like secondary to, to anything, because it's just interesting to see the wall, see the border patrol agents, all of it, when all they have to do is walk through a gap in the wall and just step foot in America, and then they're here. You know what I mean? And the issue, I know a lot of people are saying, well, that's terrible. We shouldn't let these people into the United States. But you got to remember that 
a huge majority, 50% of the people that we've seen at the border are coming from like Guatemala. And now, I know that Vice President Harris made her way down there and they're talking about all this relief money to help stop the need for people to make mass exoduses from their countries to come to America. But the issue isn't that it's, it's and, I, and I hate saying this because it even, it makes me even frustrated to hear that all these Mexicans come and trying to steal American jobs. I mean, there's so many people that are coming across this border that are just doing anything they can to escape, like, the oppressive state or the lack of ability to have any kind of economic support that'll give them the leg up to actually survive in the country that they're in. So, you know, it's... And what, then, what do you think about that, Jeremy? Well, that's the... That's interesting because the, uh, the, I guess you could call it the leftist point of view, you know, we're seeing this, this sparring, this back and forth of words between AOC and... Uh, Vice President Harris that uh, Vice President Harris came out and said don't come uh, don't make the track it's uh, it's dangerous and you will be turned away whereas AOC is saying we've propped up our money has propped up dictatorships and uh, that uh, essentially put people in dire straits and therefore we should take responsibility to some extent you're talking about like a destabilization of countries right destabilization right. of Central American countries and so forth so so, so it's interesting to see that dialogue play out on the left. Uh, it's important also to distinguish, I think one of the more interesting conversations we had was with the foreman. We yeah. had an interesting discussion with a foreman. He said he works in El Campo, which is he works the fields. He's a foreman of one of the fields. Yeah. For and the workers that are uh, doing broccoli, cauliflower, cauliflower lettuce, lettuce, things like that. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Vegetables, right? Vegetables, right. So he he was, and this was in you, uh, uh, it, this was in oh, San Luis, San which Luis is just in the just American. south of yeah, just yeah. south of Yuma, which is still in the United States. Yeah. And real fast, before you tell me this, and he he he'd been in the states for what thirty five years. Right, right. And he was there waiting for family that was coming over the border. He's right at a border crossing, um, and he had he said all but his sister um, was in America, but he still had his, his sister back in Mexico, but. But we got a chance to talk to him, Jeremy. Yeah, we let him tell him what he said. Yeah, and this was a conversation in Spanish. And I, I think some of the more interesting details were he was talking about seasonal work and the need for migrant workers because come September, he said he'd need, what, 15,000? He said thousands and thousands I think of he said 15,000 was, yeah. was, the, was the name, number he gave us of people that would be needed uh, locally. And so... But you asked, like, why, why don't... People from America here do the work in America. What do you say? Oh yeah, yeah. He said that that uh, really, it's the work is too hard. That uh, they get up at 3 a.m. They're out there for 15 hours working the fields, and that the mindset and the uh, the the will to do that work. He said that he's only seen a couple of you know who he defined as sort of I guess. Of the American or of, uh, not, Weirdos. not of like me, it's me white guys, <laughs> not of his, that culture. And he said that'll last like two hours or so. Yeah, that's and, exactly what he said. And then say, Oh, well, I tried that. Let me just think about how we were up. Uh, <coughs> we were out, you know, you had sunblock uh, uh, yesterday when we were in the desert. I mean, it was over. I still got burned, yeah. A hundred degree plus te te temperature. You were you were lit up like a you know yeah. a Christmas light. So. We were out there for a couple hours, <laughs> and that's about it. And that's about all we had. We didn't have enough water. We didn't have enough, like I guess, like endurance to like stay out in the elements of that you know that heat for any longer than we were already out there. Right. We were out there, and I and I was looking at the GPS. You know, the one question just to backtrack that I'd ask the Brazilians, I'd be curious to know if they had a smartphone with them, and if they were looking at the maps. Because a big part, a big component, even in podcasts we listen to for Border Patrol, is just how much information is out there. That people get their information on Facebook if they're crossing over, or you know that these Facebook groups or, or information maps are circulating. And uh, even though there was no markings of any kind, and the wall was still a couple of miles away, I was able to look at the that, that aren't legal, uh, that aren't working legally, either off a of work visa or off of, because they're. Citizenship, um, they get you know they don't get any uh, any kind of benefits, any kind of medical treatment. Um, their rate of pay is a lot lower. Um, their work that they're put through, uh, their work hard, longer hours, and so uh, there's a fear there of asking for more because of being deported. And 
that being said, it, it's it's hard though because, like you said, they need these people to come across. Like there, there's a big draw because there's two types of work. They do the fruit and the vegetables. And it's like basically it's like a six month rotation, right? Different, yeah. Uh, different. Like you said, there's like fifteen thousand jobs that are going to be opened up for people that they need to come over. Now they have, they do provide in, in, in cases, and I'm sure that that's probably like the like the holy grail of opportunities for people to get their six month work visa where they can come over, do the work. And then going back home because uh, many of these people, you guys, are, are proud of their nationality. Uh, they just want to be able to make some, make some money and take that back home. And even our host family that we're staying with had a very unique perspective because our host and her family, her husband and children, live in the United States in Yuma, but all, they they uh, but she works in Mexico in a family practice, dental practice, uh, along with her sister. And her sister lives in Mexico with her family, her husband, and they stay on that side of the border. So, um, like Jeremy was talking about, there's, and this kind of takes away from what I think a lot of people are focusing on, uh, which is the, the the migrant aspect of the border. But there's also the the commerce aspect of the border, uh, and then the things that have been affected by uh, by COVID. But, but I think that's kind of a whole other well, topic of conversation. The, that's that's an impression you say. What you know? What did I not expect? Or what did I not think of? I yeah. I'd heard these the talking point that border towns are interdependent. In other words, that they're part of a local commerce and a, uh, a border economy, so to speak, where they're uh, where trade happens. And uh, just as, as you have people coming south to north, we saw a lot of people who were going north to south. Yep. Folks that were um, you know white folks that were coming in for. Uh, dental work that that they could get at a fraction of the price. Also, there you could go and get your prescription filled. You know, there were opticians that were there. You it was in, like the end of the night, I think. Like the one border closed in Yuma, in the um, Los Alagones uh, area. Yeah. That border closed at 2 p.m. due to right. COVID. Um, where the San Luis border crossing closes at 10 p.m. But I would say that going across the border north to south was just as busy almost as coming south to north at the time of the border closing. Right. So there's just many people that are trying to get back. We ran into, we were trying to talk to people actually in San Luis that were um, crossing the border back to Mexico right before at like 9 o'clock, 9.30. Yeah. They had to get in line to get back across the border. That were wearing, you know, their work shirts from like a local McDonald's. Um, they were grocery shopping. People that were just coming over to get groceries and things of that nature. And so, um, well, the border, and that's the, the idea, is that you have people, you have trade, and you have relations, you have family, and the border happens, you know, in between them at times, you know, and uh, depending on the history and stuff, I gotta watch your exits, but, uh, yeah, right. uh, but so, so that was just, that brought, bringing that into relief and seeing that a little more clearly, I, I thought that made an interesting impression that a lot of, the majority of people are just, um, you know, essentially pursuing economic opportunity and, and capitalist endeavors uh, in, and, uh, you know, so much of headlines gets sidetracked by illicit illegal activities and anecdotes and cartels, but I would need to see that, in my opinion, to give a more accurate uh, portrayal of, of what that really is, because, you know, that, that is a factor. That is cartel. a fact. We know it, but to talk because, like uh, Gabriel was saying, that we asked him about if it was dangerous in, in the border towns, and Gabriel was saying that the foreman he was saying like, well, there's shootings every day in San Luis. There's people that get killed. But even even that and that's we, cartel we on cartel. We need to crime. verify that. I was True. trying to look up. I had a hard time looking up San Luis San Luis uh, crime statistics. But again, that's on the Mexican side of the border, and so. Right. I so, mean, it's a matter of what's going to be reported based off of... There is, there is a cartel presence on the border no matter what you do. Right. The because question, it's a multi-billion the, dollar industry. The question is, where is that presence the most <clears throat> significant? You know, it might not be right where we were. And to be clear, you guys, we're, we're very aware of the fact that there's things happening all along the Texas border. Um, and and the, the mass stretches of border through Arizona and California. Uh, this is just one small, you know, one small section of border that we were able to, to explore. Uh, for a couple days and we didn't even scratch the surface I mean, we could have been down there for weeks getting to talk to more people about I mean we got a chance to talk to um, uh, our host Liza's sister who works very closely with a women's shelter in, uh, in uh, across the border in Mexico 
um, for women that are women and children that are looking to flee uh, you know, situations that they're coming from. Now, I don't know all the details of what brought them there, but the the overarching um, feeling there was that they were trying to get away from abusive and dangerous situations where they where they live. So. Um, and someone said something about white privilege and like, yeah, there, that, there, that does play into some of the things we have. But like, I only had my, my Washington state driver's license and I was able to cross the border uh, mul- multiple times with right. just my Washington state driver's license. But we license. did have to, we did have to submit to full automobile searches both and times. And Jeremy got a cavity check last night. So they, <laughs> they really did the work on him. They were like, nope, sorry, bud, we got to check you. Sorry, man. Well, it didn't help that I was like, you should really check him. Like, he was doing extensive shopping in Mexico. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, he did do. I shopping. did do extensive shopping. I, he did. I got, I got, a, I got some cool stuff. I Curios. A custom mailbox. Curios. Was that right? Curios. 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 That's close enough. But you know, uh, both times. I mean, it is. It is important. I think it's when you have a driver's license, you're gonna get. Uh, and you're trying to get back to the United States with just a state driver's license, you're going to have your whole, your, your vehicle's going to be checked. Yeah. Bottom, you know? And then, you know, and for me, I think that it may, it would have been a lot different, I think, six, seven months ago. You know what I mean? But now it's, it's definitely changed because, I mean, if I were so inclined, I would have got a monetary fine is what the, the right. Border Control agent said. Border Patrol agent. Sorry, I keep saying control, but whatever you want. It was their web page that that, right? Um, no, so there was two things that they said. If you were to come across and they were to choose to be, um, I can't remember the uh, the initials for it, the H something or other. Um, basically, they could charge you what would be the cost of getting a passport uh, at its highest rates, so a couple hundred dollars, like 300, 300 plus dollars, uh, as a fine for not having the proper documentation. Um, and then I asked the Border Patrol agent the first night we were there, and said, what would happen if we came across the border from right. Mexico um, as, a, as American citizens? And he was like, I mean, you know, you probably get like a fine for a misappropriation of like fun resources, much like calling 911 if there's not a need for a 911 you know, dispatch. So, um, but he's like, other than that, I mean, and then what we saw was how easy it would be for us to just do that. Like, we could have walked off Highway 2 in Mexico, made a trek through the border in the Cocopo Native Reser- Indian Reservation, and walked straight into the United States. We might have had to, like, you know, take a, take a quick dip in the canal, but yeah, honestly, cool. after walking through the desert there, like, it would have felt nice. You know, it would have been a, a, a welcome reprieve from the heat, and then I'd have been in America. And then all I, you know, if I were so inclined, you guys know me and my travel, how that works out. Um, I could have just said that I fell in the creek from the other side. Did but they were honest. Like if we were, once we hit the border on that side, when every time we got right up to the wall, it was like you know within two two three minutes there was a border patrol I'll, agent that got. There. I'll tell you this though: you don't need coyotes even really. You have GPS now. You know if yeah. you if you have if we hear all the significance about coyotes and that's why if if I could talk to those three Brazilian folks, I'd ask them. You know, look, do you have a smartphone? Are you on Google Maps? Where are you looking? How are you? You know, that would be the real story to try to find out how people are getting it. Because what we found is that just using Google Maps, there was enough reception out there yeah. for the most part. Now, we would it was spotty, but when I'd get two bars back, I could get on the Google Maps app. I knew where we were. I knew where the border was. I knew where the wall was. But you could grab a Garmin or something like that, you know, a GPS unit. It's going to work on a satellite. Oh, I got a satellite, yeah. Yeah, and those things run no matter where you're at. Right, true, true. So, and then once you pick a plot or a spot and you know where you're headed, it'd be really easy to just, you know, hey, you're welcome. And for all the comments that are coming in, I'm sorry, we're, we're you know, I'm not able to see them that well, honestly, because, um, well, because we're chatting here, but uh, also because it's a, it's a heavy glare right now on the phone. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, so I appreciate you guys. Uh, real, I also want to thank you all for the, uh, for being supportive of what we're out here trying to accomplish and the, and, and keep in mind, like, we don't, I don't have all the answers. I just have a lot more questions, and I'm trying to see it for myself to get a better understanding. I was lucky to have Jeremy with me, um, who speaks Spanish um, and uh, is incredibly informative and, and great at the research game. So uh, we were able to put our, our forces together and tag team 
on a, on a very informative uh, trip. Now, there's going to be more stuff we're going to put together. We'll do a we'll do a video uh, stream where we'll be able to talk a little more in detail and show some footage of some of the stuff that we we both collectively caught um, and do a highlight of, of what that was about, um, what it was like for us. But I think that um, the the thing that that opened my eyes that I was ignorant of was the thought that a lot of these people that are coming aren't just coming because they want to get a part of the American dream. It's that they're trying to escape a nightmare where they're at. And that I think is, it was hard for me to process at first that these people are not just coming from right across the border. These people are coming from border upon border upon border away for thousands of miles trying to get to America just to get a little bit of a reprieve from what they're experiencing in their, in their home countries. Now, I know that the United States government is now making promises of helping to, to make the relief efforts there. Uh, but we got a lot of problems we need to work with, guys. You know what I mean? I mean, laying on the street, if you look right over here, here, I'll show you. Th this, is, this is what we've been seeing everywhere here, even in the United States, as we, you know, every day. You know, there's, this is, there's issues, humanitarian issues that I feel that we as a, a collective can look at and, um, and do our best and do our part to try to be uh, you know, a, a contribution to, to the solution. And it's not that we have to be a part of an organization or, you know, go out and, uh, you know, run for office, though I do encourage people to, you know, be involved in local politics. But I, I really feel that we can find a way to help somebody on a small level any way that we can, you know, and make an impact in someone's life. This is me preambling to the rap because we're getting close. I have to catch a flight. Um, I bopped a one-way ticket back home because we've got the one-year um, anniversary of the CHOP in Seattle that I'll be covering this weekend. So stay tuned for that uh, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday, if not all three, at least a couple of those days. But I just definitely want to make sure you guys know that we made it back. You know, we made it across the border. It did take us about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour last night sitting in um, the control, the uh, in Border Patrol's office, you know, waiting for him to come back after running all of our information and asking yeah. questions. And they didn't just search his car. They drove his car, actually. Jeremy, where, they, like, going? where are they going? My car? Yeah, they got in his car, like, drove it away. They were like, no. So I was like, it's going to be that scene from, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off where they just, yeah. Yeah, the, the car is just like... <laughs> Going up. They run the mileage up on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, um, but yeah, it was weird. We we're sitting there, and then I see the car just kind of drive off. I'm like, he's, uh, he's like, can they, they do that? I'm like, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> he was more worried about his cow than anything, man. He's got this cow. This oh, cow yeah. he I bought up, a ceramic man. cow that they paint in this like traditional style. Which oh, Luann, I'm sorry. It's cool. It's dope. What's up? Sorry about that. Luann says, uh, we appreciate what you're doing, uh, but I need to stop in interrupting you. <laughs> right. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all good. Um, I think we covered everything that uh, I think I said everything that I wanted to as far as uh, what surprised us. I, well, I will say the the one last thing that I I reiterated over and over again was you hear about these programs where migrant workers come over and work legally that want to return home and expanding those and make, making making that more accessible uh, seems to be uh, a key a key to this seems to be making sure that the resources go towards whatever that illicit activity factor is the cartels or the, those that would exploit people who are in desperate situations working uh, internationally too with our, our neighbor Mexico to figure out how our resources can go towards curbing Abuse, really, and yeah, awesome. and getting people. Well, I think again, it means uh, making these programs more robust, where people can come to work legally, uh, understanding that there are there is a need for people to fulfill these jobs, so that when they get there, as we talked to the foreman, he told us, you know, people could be paid less, they could be exploited, they could be reluctant to take them to a hospital if there is a accident on the job. So again, it's, it, it comes down to making the, the programs more robust whereby people can come work here seasonally, legally, or otherwise. And, uh, uh, you know, so we don't... That opened my eyes a, a little bit more. As for the wall itself and its high price tag, I think we discovered that it's more than anything. It's a very expensive 
symbol, you know, for uh, the previous administration that uh, it's a uh, so, well, thirty million dollars a it was a third per mile per mile yeah so millions of millions of dollars per mile just in Arizona that could have been allotted to otherwise you know more um, no look maybe there are sections where it's needed and so forth but um, and you know the point that Border Patrol makes is that it also provides infrastructure and roads surrounding the wall area. So, you know, it's a balance. Like with all of these stories that we're covering, it's it, to me, it's not the absolute, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, the civil unrest, COVID, this, everything that we've seen over the last year, the absolute is rarely the most logical and most productive answer. Sure. But the, the, the most productive answer the, uh, lies somewhere in between all of this, bolstering these programs to make legal migrant workers, uh, uh, these programs more robust, and then dedicating the resources uh, as far as enforcement to handle those that would exploit those who are in a desperate situation. Do you feel, and and Mary, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that contribution over on YouTube. Um, um, So, uh, Jim Tapp, you say Border Patrol... uh, Sorry, Border Patrol says that where the wall was in place, it was reduced entry by 80%. Um, we did talk to Jim Tapp. We did talk to Border Patrol agent off camera. Uh, had an incredibly candid conversation. And he said that during the Trump administration, he said that uh, it, it all but stemmed the flow of, um, of illegal crossings in the United States. Uh, he did say that things have, it's like they turned the faucet on uh, since the Biden administration came in. This isn't me trying to get political about it. These are his words, not mine. But let me ask Jeremy, what do you think when people say things like they should make um, citizen, getting to your citizenship easier and, and not as long of a process? Well, I mean, citizenship is a, is a whole different issue. And that's why I think we need to be specific about um, these issues separately. Uh, I think when it comes to people who have been here, you know, for years, um, then uh, that has to be addressed. That's the DACA program for those you know who might be in college now who still aren't citizens who came over as kids. I, th- I do think that needs to be dealt with, but we also have to keep in mind what those that future generation will be, so that we're not in the same situation again. You know, 15 years later, 20 years later, Absolutely. with all the kids that are coming across now. So, so a thoughtful, comprehensive system has to be put in place whereby this, uh, we understand the numbers of people coming in and the, and the numbers of, and the demand, and we work within those numbers in a practical way. So obviously this is above my pay grade. But, right, right. But, uh, but that, that. Uh, Carol, thank you very much while, while he's checking the map. So, thank you so much for that doing contribution over on uh, YouTube. Uh, again, my guys, thank you so much for everyone that's been able to help uh, anyway through uh, super chats. Through every, I know we weren't able to be live for a lot of it, but all the all the donations make th- these trips possible. Otherwise, um, you know, I'd be I'd be throwing my best guess at it from back home in Washington and not really getting a chance to see it and show it firsthand for you. So, um, and with the trips to come, you guys, all the all the things that come in, and I don't mind making the ask now, but if you're able to. Um, become a supporter on Facebook. That makes a big it makes a big impact. It's four ninety nine a month, uh, and it gives you full access to some of the supporter um, exclusive content. But it also, more than anything, it just helps give us the, the ability to forward plan and to actually do more stories like this, which I think are incredibly important. And, and I know that uh, you know, Jeremy and I are excited to look at more options. And, and you know, we've kind of just put our toes in the pond at this point. I think. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I think now we, we've opened up the door to, to looking at having more engaged conversations with people that are in positions that, um, like that Border Patrol agent who's now retired, uh, in one of the most informative uh, podcasts that I've ever listened to about uh, immigration, which I thought was was really powerful. Um, granted, I haven't listened to many on immigration, but he definitely had, uh, he was a 30-year veteran of uh the border patrol in Texas, and uh, the man was just wildly informed. It was incredible. Um, 
Yeah, and Eric, that is that's on the agenda. So, um, you know, Luann says thank you, CJ and Jeremy. And again, sorry, Luann, if I cut Jeremy <laughs> off in any way. I just know after getting to know Jeremy that he's got a lot of information to give, and there's key points that I think need to play into it so that we don't have those questions down the line. But um, yeah. So, uh, anything else that you feel that you'd like to let people know uh, on my end that over here? First off, let me let me go ahead and tell you this. That let them know where they can find you again. I really want to make sure to plug your channel as much as possible. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Unblocked Live. So, that's for YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter is slash Unblocked Live. And uh, you could also find me. And, you know, again, if you guys don't know, we met up just... Uh, through covering the civil unrest, traveling the country, I saw each other in different cities over the last year. On uh, met first on the East Coast, actually. Yeah, in DC. Yeah, in DC, and uh, my uh, my Twitter also is uh, at J Lee Quinn at J L E E Q U I N N and. Uh, also unblocked live yes and jeremy does a lot of things on twitter like he'll do live feeds on twitter and so if you are a twitter twitter fanatic uh which i'm not very good at i know that uh you can definitely i'm on twitter a lot, a lot more than uh, i definitely. am but so i'm, I'm multi-stream to youtube and stuff. There you go, yeah. so we'll do a conversation coming up you know yeah, in studio and yeah. you know, we'll kind of talk about what we saw and we should give uh the viewers some follow-up really look into the numbers absolutely about uh, uh, all the stuff that we just mentioned and touched on and sort of give a follow-up about what right. that what those numbers look like so if you guys have questions um, no Luann you're good I was giving you grief we're all good um, is why doesn't the president of Mexico make his make his people's lives easier in other countries too so USA doesn't overload um, Gene Kramer that's, I mean, that's a lot to unpack. Uh, granted, we'd have to have more of a, of a political insight on Mexico uh, and all these other countries, much like Guatemala, Honduras, Venezuela, where you're seeing a, a mass amount of people that are that are leaving the country. I mean, this is not just a an issue. This is long stemming problems that have that are in their countries that, that aren't just happening. They didn't just pop up overnight. Um, so to make that fix is something that I mean, I'm sure would be phenomenal. You know, if we could just you know, make the little Thanos snap. Uh, not to make people go away, but just to make things change. I want to make that clear uh, for those Marvel buffs. But um, but really, um, there, there is issues. There's corruption that we have to deal with. And that's one of the things the Border Patrol agent said. He's like, every department has people that are paid off on both sides of the border. It's not like it's rampant amongst the Border Patrol because they're, they're heavily vetted and, you know, they go through an extensive uh, amount of, you know, background i mean just like you would if you were becoming anything in uh law enforcement but uh they definitely have hey. <laughs> he oh hey he mom. says yeah <laughs> uh and so for for me i feel like the issues if nothing else now the crisis and every time you see that the the hashtag crisis anything border crisis homeless crisis if nothing else if it draws attention to the problem and it wakes people up to the thought, the, the, the knowledge or the, the, the knowing that it needs to make a change. And I think that's important is that we realize that uh, we do need to see a change. And if you're in America and you feel like it doesn't affect you, um, you know, just remember that on a human level, even if it hasn't quite touched you in your state or your city, uh, it should affect you. You know, I mean, there's people that, that are fleeing to this country. They're not they're not just trying to overrun it. They're fleeing to the country. And that, by definition, is they're trying to get away from something. And the things that they're moving towards are like a promise for a better tomorrow. And I think I get, it, it, with all the, the BLM coverage that I've done and everything, I get I get a lot of people that have thrown the whole, you know, you, get, you have the white privilege, white privilege, white privilege. And I really want to snap back and be like, you have American privilege. You have you have American privilege. Don't Don't assume that just because I'm white, now I'm on the upper elite level. We have an amazing amount of privilege here in America, just to be very, very clear. We went no more than 10 minutes across the border and there were full families with babies like, you know, that are like laying in the dirt, like legitimately. Yeah, this under, is just Mexico. Tree, we're we're like yeah. by the bridge. Yeah. We're not making this stuff up. Yeah. So when you when you think about someone else's privilege, just appreciate you yourself are very privileged. If you're sitting here in America, if you've got a roof over your head, you've got food in your stomach and if you've got 10 cents in a piggy bank, you're already doing better than like 90% of the world. So just just please appreciate that and take that into consideration. So when we start casting these overarching statements like go back to where you came from or shut down the borders and keep them all out, let's keep America American. Like, you know, we've been a country of people that have fled to find better opportunity that founded this country. So 
That being said, the ultimate American thing to do would be to open up our arms and embrace people that are looking for a better tomorrow and that are trying to escape the, 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 the atrocities of the place they might be coming from. So that I think would be the most American thing we can do, you know? And, um, you know, so I'm gonna leave it on that. And, uh, and I hope you guys have maybe learned something new uh, seeing something that you maybe didn't expect to see. We definitely have footage that we shot, B-roll type stuff, whatever you want to call it, uh, when we weren't able to film. And it, honestly, it got so hot while we were out there. Um, and killed the rain I Killed the Rainbow um, on YouTube, that's what we're working on. If they do it legally, then sure. And appreciate that they need those people to be able to work here. So the legalities that are involved is that, like Jeremy was saying, they need a more robust system in play that'll help nurture and cater to people that are looking to fill those jobs. People that are not just looking to fill the jobs on that side of it, but for people that are seeking asylum, that are looking for something to get them in a safe place where they're not gonna be oppressed and or killed, you know, for whatever cause, be it religious or other reasons, in the countries they come from. So, um, uh, okay, so CJ, what happens when our country is overwhelmed and we want to flee to their country? Eric, do, do you really feel our country is going to be overwhelmed? Do you feel that the land... Um, yeah, I don't know what's happening with uh, the feed right now. Hopefully it's it's working properly. You might have to just refresh is what you need to do uh, there, little Linda Harvey. <laughs> um, well, hey, I love you guys. I'm glad you're able to come along for this ride. Um, I'm glad Jeremy was able to be with us on this trip. We got more to come. We're going to be following up. We're not going to leave you in the lurch and, uh, and you know, just kind of where things are at. Uh, we have uh, plenty more stuff that we want to talk to you about. And if you have questions, um, yeah, Diana, you said it right. You know, uh, it's free. Yes, it's freezing and loop. I don't know. I can't help it. Um, either way. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. Retha Bell, we, we do need to focus attention on giving uh, America what they deserve, what they need, you know, the medical attention that they need. Uh, yeah, hopefully if we're back on, we're back on. If you just have to refresh, um, whatever channel you might be on. But if you have questions um, that we might be able to answer or that you would like to see us look into, um, please, uh, please help us. Send the emails in to cj at cjtv.live and I'll do my best to go ahead and uh, field those questions. We'll get them put up, we'll do the research and hopefully have answers for you next time we go live uh, with Jeremy and I. Um, or, you know, either or. So uh, we love you guys. And again, thanks for helping make it possible through uh, contributions uh, and, uh, you know, and your support on our supporter page uh, means a lot. But we're gonna cut out here and I gotta hop a plane. And I'll be seeing you guys uh, tomorrow. So set yourself up for notifications uh, because I'll be back live from Seattle uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so between now and then, guys, take care of yourselves. We'll talk to you soon. Jeremy. Peace. Later.